Now we're going to hear about Mike, yeah. some bidirectionality and constraint solving and program synthesis, things close to my heart. There's work coming out of the Netherlands, correct? Is it, do you pronounce it Neek? Is that how you say it? Neek. Neek. All right. Welcome, Neek. Thank you. Uh, hello? Yeah? Oh, okay. Yeah, that sounds better. Um, so uh, for the implementation, there's also many different possible implementations that you, that you could want to generate using program synthesis. And this is often not really uh, discussed as much. Usually there's a specification and we just try to get a, an implementation. But in some way, uh, figuring out which implementation you actually want is part of the specification, even though those implementations are, are equivalent. So uh, a common implementation for the Dupli function would be the structurally recursive one, uh, which hopefully this syntax is familiar by now. Um, but you could have the same function uh, using a recursion scheme, such as a, a right fold, which is basically the same, but it's a slightly different uh, approach. Uh, or you could use 
helper functions or imported functions such as concat and map. So in this, ca this case, uh, we map some function over the list that replaces every element by a list containing that element twice. And then we have a list of lists which we concat concatenate again. Uh, and there's many more uh, programs uh, such as, for example, this one, which I think is quite nice, but might not me be the most insightful or, or not really the one that you would want. Um, and my argument is that the main difference between these implementations is actually the functions that are used to define it. I hope you agree on that. Um, and the reason that I care about this is, is one of the, the implementations that I try to work towards is to use this kind of program synthesis to give feedback to students that are actually learning how to program in Haskell. So while they're writing a program, uh, they might choose any of these implementations to work towards. Um, and on their, while they're on their way and having a program that's only half finished, uh, I want to try to use this program synthesis to finish their solution and based on that give them feedback like you're on the right track uh, or there is a solution that is this many steps away. Um, or maybe give some hints as to which functions uh, they could s still use uh, that they might not know about yet. Right, so uh, there are some program synthesizers that are able to type an to have an example driven synthesis uh, for these uh, implementations. So there's Myth by o Osera and Zdansevich, um, which can generate uh, uh, structurally recursive definitions for uh, algebraic data types. And then there's an extension, uh, Smith by Lubin et al., which uh, introduces the idea of sketching, where you start from a, a, a program that's already like half filled in with some holes. Uh, a different approach is by uh, Fazer et al. in Lambda Squared, where they uh, sort of try to do the same thing, but instead of using structural recursion, um, they um, use recursion schemes and helper functions such as map, refers, but just a, a small set of common functions. And uh, our approach tries to, to do what they do in the same way, actually, but just for a, a way larger uh, array of, of functions. Basically, any function that's just defined as a, um, as a structurally recursive function um, as long as we know its definition, we should be able to use it during, uh, during synthesis. And how do we do it? Well, we did this with um, using constraint propagation. So uh, well, here is the, the view that we saw before. And now constraint propagation, uh, uh, the idea is that you start with uh, some constraint that you know is valid. And then at every decision point, uh, you, st you check if the constraint is valid up to this point, instead of only checking once the program is, is finished. And then you can see that there are some, some gray arrows that uh, can be pruned away early, and then you get a smaller uh, program space to explore. Uh, I will first talk a bit about type propagation, because it's, it's fairly simple, and, and basically all, um, all top-down program synthesizers use this, where, uh, well, you have some context and you have a sketch where I present the hole in the program using this square. Um, and the square has, has, this hole has a type. And now we can just see these are the, the possible functions that we could put into this, this type. And, and as you can see, the, the, the correct functions that are type correct have holes which are, uh, for which we also know the type. So we basically create subproblems for a synthesizer by, by propagating these types forward through the expression. Um, and in the case of map, we could, or, oh, sorry, yeah, there's also some natural numbers might also be, uh, be included here. Uh, and what we're working towards here is, is a function of, um, of Dupli that uses concat map and, and replicate. Um, so in the case of map, there might be some more uh, expressions there, but we will mainly look at the other case where uh, we want to fill in this whole like, from A to list of A. And the functions replicate and repeat fit, but map and concat map and all the natural numbers, they, they don't really fit. Uh, and then for repeat, there's no holes left, for, but for replicate, we have one hole, which can be any natural number. So now you can sort of see a bit visually how this uh, program space is, is uh, pruned by using this type propagation. Um, 
And instead of doing type propagation, we on, or in addition to type propagation, we also want to do example propagation. And this is the, the, the interesting part, I think. So here is, a, is the same hole, but now with a so-called example constraint, which is, has some test input and output examples uh, that describe how this is duplicated. And this is, of course, not uh, uh, exhaustive definition. You can have many wrong implementations of dupli, but this is just for the means of, of uh, pruning the search tree. right? Um, so uh, in the case of map, we cannot actually generate a new constraint because that would be a conflict because uh, the input and output lists are not of the same length. But for concatmap, we see that there's actually one concrete implementation or one concrete specification for the whole, uh, which says that A should be mapped to A comma A and B should, should be mapped to B comma B. Uh, so that's very nice. Uh, and from there, we can continue and we see that repeat uh, again does not give the right result because repeat will just return an infinite list of, of uh, uh, values. But replicate uh, does give a, a concrete constraint, namely two. Um, and then there's only one option left. So now we've seen how using type and example propagation uh, together, we get to a single uh, solution. Um, we have pruned the search tree so that there's only one correct implementation left. Um, now this example propagation, how does it work? Well, um, this is not my work, unfortunately, but it's great work by uh, Lubin et al. Um, and the, the general idea is, is, is fairly simple, but, but uh, ingenious because of that, where you take a function and you just try to evaluate it as, as much as possible. Um, so in the case of, of concatmap, uh, it's like implicitly uh, applied to the input list and you just um, yeah, apply to that and then figure out like what's left over. So you will get some lists, in this case containing holes, and this should be matched against some other list and then you match those holes onto the examples that you see on the right hand side. Um, and that's a, a gross oversimplification. Um, but that's generally how it works. Um, so the, the intuition basically for, um, for our whole approach is that um, Smith that I talked about earlier uh, allows you to do sketching where, um, where, you, come, where you start from a, a, a program that still contains holes, but you can push the examples through to get um, like the constraints on each of the holes and then start synthesis from there. But we just basically repeat that, that process by keeping, keep introducing uh, new sketches in our, in our sub-synthesis problems. And the, the main, uh, our main contribution here is figuring out how you should introduce these functions such as the, that, that the constraints do not explode. Um, all right, and this uh, brings us to our implementation uh, scribe, uh, which is uh, our new uh, program synthesizer. And uh, the main idea is that we have uh, imports also as, as, as a new kind of way to specify the behavior along with already defined types and um, uh, with types and sketches and uh, input output examples. Uh, and we have uh, tested our, our approach on a, on a benchmark using the combined benchmarks of myth and lambda squared. And, um, well, five times speed up sounds nice, but I have to add, this is a five times speed up of our own synthesizer compared to our synthesizer without this example propagation. But the, the, the promising thing is that uh, lambda squared uses a very similar approach where they use example propagation for very specific functions, a ha a handcrafted propagation rules. And they also saw a, a five or I think maybe six times speed up compared to not using these rules. Uh, so it seems that our approach has a similar benefits, but can be, um, yeah, can be applied way more generally on different kinds of uh, functions. 
Um, so yeah, in the end, this will lead us to uh, a correct implementation, given all these constraints. So we combine the, the context, in this case, map, the types, uh, the sketch, and the examples. Uh, and then additionally, we have some extra things to get to the concrete solution. So um, by introducing all these uh, possible helper functions that you can introduce yourself, um, we, uh, wait, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. I'm talking about normalization now. <laughs> uh, you introduce a, a lot of, of uh, expressions that are not in normal form. Um, so we use some normalization techniques uh, to, to prune away many expressions that, that would not be in normal form. Uh, and this is uh, also used in, in, uh, in similar papers. This is, not, this is not new work, but this is a, a, a necessary addition that we had to do by, when uh, introducing a, a context. Um, and we use weights to, uh, to perform a basically a weighted search uh, instead of backtracking. And um, I don't have a slide for this, I think, but if we go back a little bit, um, you can imagine that the weights basically uh, stretch out the, the arrows. So if you want to make sure that, that this, um, this wrong program will not be found before our correct solution, then we might want to increase the weight so that this one is pushed further. Um, and uh, the way that we uh, introduce these weights, uh, among other things, is that we look at the, the examples that are generated throughout the synthesis. And um, then we, we try to figure out if those um, constraints actually like, lead to a, to a better solution. So we use uh, the constraints not only to, to prune away uh, large swaths of the, of the program space, but we also use it as a sort of heuristic to guide us to a correct implementation. Um, all right. And that's basically all I had to say. I think I may be a bit early, but I don't think that's a big problem because we're having lunch soon. <laughs> so uh, yeah, thank you all for coming in, and I hope you have some questions. Thank you, Nick. Any questions? Have you considered adding something like quick check properties as one of the ways to rule out the bad ones? Um, yes. Yeah, so the quick check prop, like that's a way of using properties as a as a yeah as a some ki some kind some kind of properties. Yeah. Yes, I've definitely considered that. Um, one problem is a bit that the, the overhead of, of propagating these constraints is sort of exponential in the size of the input-output examples that you have. So if you um, use quick check and just generate a bunch of input-output examples from a property, then it's not very beneficial. But what you could do, which uh, I'm still working on, is that you um, incrementally add more input output examples based on the quick on quick check. So you start with none, find the first program, use quick check to find a counterexample, and then find a correct example to continue. So you have like a counterexample guided synthesis loop. Uh, is this uh, plugin available, or is this available as a whole fit plugin for GHC or something, so that it's easy to try out? Uh, no, unfortunately, not as a as a plugin. It, it's just the code is available, of course. But okay, so uh, is, do you think it's feasible to include that somehow? Because then it's probably also very good for teaching. Like it, this is uh, eventually uh, one of the goals, yes. But uh, this work is, is also focused on on like algebraic data types, so there's no inherent support for, for integer primitives, mm -hmm. uh, for example. Uh, and working a bit on, on ways to, to implement that, but that's uh, yeah, further down the line. Um, I was very impressed by the way you're propagating examples there. And it seems you mentioned that it was sort of tricky. And I was just trying to think myself how you would propagate examples through fold R, which has two boxes. And they're sort of interact in sort of painful ways. Have you done any um, synthesizing of 
fold R cases? Yes, actually, synthesis with fold R is, is uh, not that difficult. Uh, let's see, the, the main problem, like it's, it's, it's a bit uh, difficult to show on the slides, that's why I, I, I didn't have an extensive example of it. But what basically happens is that um, the left-hand side of the, of, the con of the constraints will contain holes. So we'll refer to other holes, uh, and these will be eventually resolved. So new constraints will be introduced um, during the synthesis. So basically, fold R will not really contain any useful constraints because there's almost, yeah, like most functions can be implemented using a fold. Um, but then while more, more choices are made, this introduces more constraints. Um, and yeah, for fold R, that works um, reasonably well. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, there's some cases where it doesn't really work well, which is usually if there's like, if you try to synthesize like a hylomorphism or something where there's an in, uh, intermediate structure that you don't know about. Yeah. Uh, maybe a not so technical question. So have you tried to ask ChatGPT to synthesize <laughs> your program? <laughs> yes, I have. Yeah. I have. And what was your experience? Um, it's a bit, it's a bit demotivating. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, yeah. Let me say like this. So I had like a, a, a student who was looking into into a copilot and how you can modify the prompts to to b improve the results. So there were some some up, um, you said, looked at some programming exercises and then tried copilot to to make solve them and then change the prompts in, in predictable ways to see what the outcome was. And in general, the copilot seemed to be really bad at it. And then when I, um, once she handed in the report and I wanted to grade it, ChatGPT just came out. So I just tried everything in ChatGPT and everything worked. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> yeah. But it does not give any guarantees, of course, about the results of the uh, program. And it's very interesting from an educational perspective because you can also ask GPT to explain certain things. Uh, but in these cases, I also want to use the, the specific constraints that are generated throughout the, the, the program search um, to, yeah, to inspect them and, and do stuff with them, uh, which ChatGPT does not uh, offer. So I think the convincing example in the future is where ChatGPT gives you no good answer and you have better answers. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, and I think in in terms of of complexity of programs, I can't really compete with with uh, something like that. So you have to take another approach. Yes. So I'm really interested in what your plans are for using this with students because that's been we've been building an example driven synthesis tool, thinking about applying those in introductory programming courses, and I'm we've been trying to figure out how to surface the result in a way that's helpful for students uh, without like encouraging the students to just guess stuff or uh, just giving them the answer, which is obviously not, which is not helpful any more than handing them chat GPT would be, uh, except ours might be m more accurate but uh, still not very helpful. So I'm curious to hear more about your plans. Yeah, so um, I, I started out a bit from Ask L. I don't know if you know about it, but it's a, a, a similar tool, but it doesn't use any, any program synthesis. It, it just has a bunch of model solutions and then tries to, to transform student uh, attempts to, to conform to these model solutions and then tries to match them. And the feedback that it gives is really bad. The feedback is just, do this now, or introduce a pattern. Like it just tells you what to do, um, and this also means that the data sets that are generated by this kind of tool are, are pretty difficult. So I'm also trying to work on, on generating a more a, a non-biased data set of what students actually write during pr programs to see what kind of feedback they would want to receive. Uh, but the kinds of feedback that I think would be that you would be able to give with uh, these synthesizers are things like you're on the right track, um, the, you're this many steps away. Perhaps you can, f uh, if you sort of uh, decompose a student program into whole fillings and then apply them one by one 
in a synthesis approach. You can sort of retrace the synthesis and figure out what the constraints were at different parts of their program, different parts of the implementation. And then you can point out where some conflict arises. Um, and if their program is correct, then you can tell them you're missing a part here, and this is the exact specification in terms of input-output examples that you want to use there. Um, uh, I also would like that one of the main reasons that we sort of wanted to allow many different kinds of contexts to be used is, is uh, so that you could have a student model that models what this, which functions the student knows and then based on that give feedback such as uh, you might want to use the concat function, you may not have heard of it, and then point to some, some relevant media. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Thank you very much. Let's thank Nick one more time.